Today we're going to build a single player tic-tac-toe game with variable AI difficulty, meaning we're going to have like a super easy mode and then we're going to slowly scale up that difficulty through some logic. This is the first video in a series I'm starting uh, that's all about helping you create projects for your portfolio. And that brings me to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Head to squarespace.com slash Sean Allen if you want to get your iOS developer portfolio or maybe a website for your app up and running very quickly. All right, let's dive into the project. So there is no starter project to review or anything. I just did file new Swift UI project. Here we are, blank canvas. A quick note though, this is not for absolute beginners. Uh, this does assume that you have some basic Swift and Swift UI knowledge. So I'm not gonna explain all the little basics, but I will be explaining what I do, of course. But uh, just to let you know, this is more of an intermediate type tutorial. And how we're gonna build this, of course, we're gonna start off building the game board UI. Then we're gonna work on our game logic, right? With that AI difficulty and how do you make the uh, the computer take a turn by itself, that kind of thing. Uh, and then at the end, we're gonna refactor, clean up the code and uh, refactor into MVVM, model view, view model. So I think you're gonna learn a lot in this video. There's a lot packed in here. It's not just a simple tic-tac-toe UI. There's a lot going on. So stick around. I think you're gonna learn a ton. So to kick things off, let's build our game board that you see here on the design. Now, what that is, is that's a grid for us in SwiftUI, specifically a lazy V grid. And we're gonna have three columns, right? Three columns and three rows, typical tic-tac-toe board. So let's create that here in our code. Let's get rid of text, hello world. Let's do lazy V grid, and we'll initialize that. You see it takes columns and content. I'm actually going to get rid of this content uh, parameter name just to clean it up. We don't need it. And then you see it takes a grid item. Right now there's only one grid item with a fixed width of two. We want three grid items to make up our columns, right? We want three columns. So instead of like putting it here in the initializer, I'm gonna refactor it out a little bit to clean it up. Do let columns, uh, which is an array of grid items. And that is going to equal my empty array here. And I'll hit return here just to get rid of that placeholder stuff. And essentially, we're gonna do something similar here. So I'll command X this here, command V it into my array. Now, we don't want fixed, we want uh, dot flexible. Dot flex. And we're not gonna do the autocomplete because we don't want the minimum maximum. And again, we want to have uh, three of these. So I'll copy, hit return, paste, paste, there we go. That's our array of grid items, right? So now here in columns, instead of like putting all that in there, I can just put uh, columns, right? So now we have our lazy V grid of columns. We just have text placeholder. That's what it gave us when we did the autocomplete. Um, but we'll go ahead and just for show here, we'll do three of them here. Hit try again on our preview and you should see uh, three. Oh, I don't need that parentheses anymore that I got rid of the uh, content parameter. And now you see, once I restarted my preview, we got three uh, columns of placeholder. There's only one, right? If I had nine of them, you would see nine. Actually, let's do that just for illustrative purposes here. Real quick, copy paste to get nine. Now you see kind of like the beginnings of our tic-tac-toe board, except instead of the word placeholder, we wanna have some kind of like square or something that we can actually put like our X's and O's for tic-tac-toe, just to give you the idea of like what we're doing here. So instead of hard coding nine things, four uh, each, and we'll initialize that. We'll just do ID and content, even though we don't need a lot of this. So our data is gonna be zero uh, up and two, but not including uh, nine. And I can actually get rid of a lot of these parameters here. Uh, we don't need the ID in this particular case, and I don't need that. And I can just do uh, open and closed uh, view builder, but I do need uh, I in, right? Because as we iterate, through zero through nine, right? We want I for like our index, right? We wanna be at place zero, place one, place two, place three, right? That's how we know where we are on the board. So uh, what is in our for each, right? Before we had nine placeholders. Well, now I wanna have a Z stack because our square, or in my case is gonna be a circle just for design purposes, but we wanna have whatever square we have there. And then when the player taps on it, we wanna put an X or a circle on top of that. So that's why we do the Z stack, right? Vertical uh, views here. So Z stack and uh, at the bottom of the Z stack, I'm gonna have a circle and I'm gonna do uh, foreground color dot red and we're gonna do dot opacity 0 0.5. And by the way, this is just my design choice, the color, the opacity, the circle. Make this your own. That, that's another thing I should point out for like 10 seconds. Like when I say I'm gonna help you make portfolio projects, don't just like copy and paste what I have. Take the time, add some design to it, maybe add a couple little extra features, like make it your own before you add it to your portfolio. Just use this as like the launching point or like a base. Okay, uh, so now my circles are, are pretty small. <laughs> As you can see, that's not what we want there. So we need to give it uh, some sort of frame, but if I hard code the frame, 
like 90 by 90 or something like that, it's not gonna look you know, the same on all screen sizes. So in order to kind of get the relative screen size, I'm gonna use what's called a geometry reader uh, in Swift UI. So we're gonna do that uh, at the kind of the top level of the view. So geometry uh, reader here, as you can see, and we'll open up our view builder and do geometry uh, in, right? Because that's, uh, that's what we're gonna use to get our relative view size. So we'll uh, cut our initial V grid and put it inside our geometry reader. That way we have access again to the uh, relative um, screen size. Now you'll notice it pushed up our circles to the top. We don't wanna do that. So in our uh, geometry reader here, we're gonna add a V stack uh, with a spacer at the top and a spacer uh, at the bottom, this is going to put our lazy V grid here, our tic-tac-toe board, essentially, command X, uh, put those in between the spacers. That is going to put, again, a spacer at the top, spacer at the bottom, which will move our tic-tac-toe board. Doesn't really look like a tic-tac-toe board quite yet, but it'll put that in the middle. Um, so now back to our circle here. And by the way, at the end of this video, we're gonna spend a good 10 minutes refactoring. <laughs> so if it looks a little messy right now and confusing, it'll look nice and neat by the time we're done, but it's a process. Okay, so uh, foreground color, uh, dot red. Now we're gonna do dot frame and the width and height here. So you see here, we get these 100 by 100 uh, circles by default, which kind of looks like we, what we want, but you can see the spacing isn't consistent, you know, both vertically and horizontally. And again, as the screen, you know, gets bigger or smaller on like a smaller iPhone SE or something like that, uh, it's gonna it's gonna change. So that's why we wanna use the geometry reader. So we wanna use uh, geometry.size.width, and then you're gonna think, think the width should be divided by three, right? We wanna have three equal uh, squares, and that'll work. And then uh, we can also uh, do Command C and Command V into height to get that. And I'm gonna put my parameters here on, on two different lines. Hit try again. Oops, I, I copied the parameter name there. Let's not do that, that's not gonna work. Okay, so this looks kind of cramped. As you can see, there's not like a lot of spacing like in between. Uh, and especially if you had, instead of a circle, let's say you did rectangle, you can do this, right? And see how easy it is to change. Now you can see if I get rid of kind of like my red outlines, it, it's it's hugging the, the side, the spacing's a little weird. It doesn't quite look right. So we're gonna actually put some spacing in here, negative uh, 15 to, to let it breathe, or minus 15, I should say. And then uh, minus 15, again, to let that breathe a little bit. Uh, and I can see it's starting to look a little more symmetrical. We can also, let's go back to circle here. But again, if you want rectangle, keep it rectangle, that's cool. We can also go up to our V grid. I deleted this parameter before here on line 19, and I can add the spacing uh, parameter back in, and let's give it a five. And there, that looks a little more symmetrical. Uh, you can like kind of dial that in and, and tweak it if you like, but we're gonna stick with this for now. And actually one last thing, because it is kind of hugging the edges on our V stack here, uh, you can see it's highlighting that my V stack curly brace up there. We are gonna just add some default uh, padding, again, just to move it in from the edges a little bit. So there we go. That's the basics of our tic-tac-toe board. Now in the Z stack here, right, that just has our circle uh, at the bottom, on top of that, we wanna have the ability to either add like an X or, or an O. So for that, we're gonna do an image in our Z stack on top of our circle image, let me scroll up a little bit here, and we're gonna do system name. Uh, that's gonna be way down here. Uh, the reason we're doing system name is because we're gonna use SF symbols. And I wanted to do this to give you some flexibility. For example, I know the SF symbol for X mark, or for the X is just called X mark. As you can see now, we got little little X's in there, not quite how we want it to look. So let's do something real quick. So with image, uh, let's give it a frame. Uh, we're gonna do 40 by 40. It's a pretty uh, universal image there, or size there. Actually, I forgot to do uh, dot, Oops, dot resizable, so that can be big. There you go, nice, big, and bold. That's what we're looking for. And then the last thing is dot foreground color, dot white. I mean, again, change the colors, make it your own, that's fine. But that's what we're working with here. There's our, our X's, and for our circles, instead of X marks, it's just a circle, as you can see here, right? And again, so I just did uh, SF Symbols. If you're not familiar with SF Symbols, uh, it's an app with a bunch of icons here. I'm gonna, I have it open here, there you can see SF Symbols bunch of icons that you can choose from. So you can imagine like, I'll just go to like nature. I mean, you could do tortoises versus hares, right? Again, you know, ants versus lightning bolts, whatever. It doesn't have to be X's and circles, but you would just copy this string for whatever you want it to do. And again, there's like a whole bunch of them you can choose from. Um, but yeah, make it your own, have a little fun with it. I'm gonna stick with X's and O's uh, for right now though. So that's the basics of our UI. Of course, we got a long way to go. Uh, what I wanna set up now is uh, like our moves, right? We need to track the moves. When a player taps on one of these circles, we need to keep track of like 
what move I as the player made, what move the computer AI made, right? We need to track all that. So I'm gonna create some objects here, but let me get rid of this space. It's really bothering me. Um, okay, so down here above our preview, I'm going to create uh, some new objects. We're gonna create an enum called player, and that is gonna have two cases, uh, human and computer, right? And you'll see throughout this project, we're gonna be using that to obviously determine, hey, is this a human player or is this a computer player? Just a ni nice clean way to do that. Uh, and another object we're going to create is a struct uh, called move, and that is going to have a uh, property called player, which is of type player, right? Because either going to be human or computer. It's also going to have another property, uh, let board index, right? Again, this is going to be an int. So the definition of a move is, you know, what player made the move, where on the board was it, and then we're going to have a an indicator here, a computed property that we can figure out. It should it be an X or an O or whatever indicator you chose, right? So we're going to say var indicator. Uh, which is a string because it's the system name of the SF image we're using. Uh, and we're going to basically return uh, if the player, we're going to use turn memory operator here, player equals equals dot human. If that is true, we're going to use the uh, X mark. And if that is false, which means it's the computer, we're going to use the circle. And again, this is where you can put in whatever you like here. But that is our, uh, our move object. Again, the definition of the move. A move has a player. A move has a position on the board. And then a move has an indicator. So we're going to basically keep track of these moves in an array. And that's how we're going to build up uh, our game. Okay, let's scroll back up to our, our uh, view here, our content view. Uh, we'll rename that later. But let's create a state property because this is going to be the array of our move. So we're constantly going to be changing this array. So it needs to be an at, uh, whoops, I'm in the wrong spot here. I even put the, this array or this variable in the wrong spot. My bad. We're going to refactor it later anyway. That's not going to end up in the content view at the end of things. Um, but my bad on that. Um, still work. But if it's outside the struct, in case you didn't know what happened there, that means it's like a global variable that your entire app has access to. And that's that's kind of dangerous. We want to keep that within the content view. So my little mistake, sorry for any confusion. But now we're going to do an at uh, state uh, private var called moves. And that is going to be an array of type move. And it's going to be, the move is going to be optional, right? Because we're basically going to create an array that holds nine items. And if there's a move at that position, we're going to have our move object. And if there's not a move yet at that position, we're going to have a nil. So you can kind of see when a player tries to tap on a circle, we're first going to make sure that like there's not a move already there, right? So the basically the object at that index in the array has to be nil before we allow a player to make that move. You'll, we're going to code that up later. But just so you know why I'm creating an array full of nine nils to start off. So that's going to equal, uh, we're going to create an array and initialize that. And you can see we get this repeating uh, autocomplete. So we want that to repeat, uh, I'm sorry, we want to repeat nil. That's what we want it to repeat. And then the count is nine. So again, create an array of an optional type move um, with nine items, um, nine nils essentially. That's our empty game board is what that is. All right, so the foundation is starting to come together. Now let's implement the ability to, you know, tap on one of these spaces and have our indicator show up. Uh, so for temporary reasons, we're, we're not going to, this is only for like testing. Let's create another at state uh, private var called is humans turn. And it's just going to be, we're going to say equals true to start, right? This is just going to be what we're going to use to kind of flip back and forth between the X's and the circles while we test out our UI. So what I want to do here is on our, our uh, for each, right? This, because this is the item that's in our grid. So this is each one of these little red circles uh, is basically the Z stack in the for each. So on the Z stack there, not the for each itself, uh, I want to add a tap gesture, right? So each one of our red circles is going to have a tap gesture. And this is where we're going to kind of like work our magic. You know, when a player tries to tap it to put their X there, you know, we're going to do all the, all the game logic stuff. Okay, so the super simple version of this, this is going to evolve as we go. Again, you kind of got to take baby steps when you're building a program. You don't just kind of like have the envision in your head and, and build that. So uh, the baby step that we're going to kind of make here is that on the tap gesture, we want to basically add a create a move and add it to our move array, right? So we uh, access our moves array, right? And then at object, or I'm sorry, at index i, and what that means is, if you're not familiar, right, in our for each, right, we we basically called each one of our circles i, which is, you know, zero through nine. So if I tap the middle circle, that's going to be index four, right? Zero, one, two, three, four. So that's kind of what this means. So if I tap the middle one, basically at index four, add this move is what I'm trying to say here. So the, the new move equals, uh, we're going to initialize a move 
and the player uh, is going to be, uh, that's why we created this is humans turn. So if uh, it is is humans turn, again, another ternary, uh, ternary operator here, uh, if is humans turn is true, the move, uh, the player is gonna be a dot human, else it's gonna be dot computer. Right now you're starting to see that enum come into play. And then the board index that we create is I, right? Cause it's whatever one we tapped. So again, we created our move, our move object here. You know, now we know the player, we know the board index and the indicator gets kind of figured out on its own. So we created our move based on a tap. And then what we wanna do after this, again, this is kind of temporary code, but now we wanna do is humans turn dot toggle, right? So that means now it's the computer's turn. So the next time something gets tapped, you know, now this will flip to computer and we'll add a circle instead of an X. Of course, eventually the computer is going to be making its own moves and we're not going to be like doing this manually. But again, we're just trying to get our UI working. All right. So now I need to change my image system name up here. So it's not all X's, right? I want to be able to, well, I want to start blank and then be able to tap and get X's and O's. So the system uh, name we want is moves uh, at index I. So remember, this is basically our array of moves. Uh, if there is a, let's do... Well, let me finish typing before I explain. That'll help out. Dot indicator uh, or blank. So basically what I'm saying here is if there's a move at index I, right, because it could be nil, right? We're starting off with a whole array of nils. Um, then we use the indicator. Uh, this is called nil coalescing to unwrap an optional. So if there, if it's nil at that index, then we're going to use blank, right? Because if it's nil, there's there should be no X or O in there, okay? So now, uh, as we're creating our moves on tap, you know, we're gonna put an X, we're gonna create a move with an X or a circle based on human or computer, right? Based on whose turn it is. And I should be able to tap and put X's and O's on here. Uh, it'll just be the beginnings of things because it won't quite work <laughs> how we want, but you'll see. By the way, I'm in uh, dark mode, as you'll see here. Uh, if you do command shift A, you can switch between light mode and dark mode real quick on your simulator. Anyway, so let's tap lower left. Okay, there's my X. And then remember we switched is humans turn, toggle that to, so I should see a circle. There we go, X circle, X circle. Now, of course, we need to get this to where the computer's making their own moves and doing it on its own. But again, we're just testing out the UI. Uh, and we have no win conditions yet. We gotta check for all that, like circle should have won. But here's what's wrong with our UI. Because every time we tap, we're adding to the or to the moves array. Well, what I can do here is like, oh, I can, I can take circle. Uh, you know, no, let me take over this, right? I can overwrite on, uh, you know, the thing if, if something already exists, right? So we need to have a check to make sure there's not, not already a move at that index in the array, right? So basically what we're gonna say is, hey, if the space is available, go ahead and put your, your player's mark in there. Uh, if the space is not available, basically don't do anything and like make the player, you know, tap something. So that's what we're gonna do right now. So let me uh, stop my simulator here, uh, you know, still in our content view, uh, right below our body, we're gonna create a function. And quick note, all these functions eventually are gonna get refactored into our view model, in model, view, view, model. For now, we're putting them all in the view. Uh, but just a note with SwiftUI, your, your logic and your functions should be on your view model. We'll, we'll get there at the end of the video. So, uh, func called uh, is square occupied, and then we're gonna say in moves, because we have to pass in an array to check, right? Um, so we're gonna pass in an array of move, and it's gonna have a nil, right? Because there could be some nils in there. And then uh, for index, uh, we'll say index, and then int. And this is gonna return a uh, Boolean, right? Because basically true or false. Is the square occupied? True or false? Yes or no? And the quick check for that is, let me scroll up a little bit, uh, return uh, moves.contains, we're gonna do dot .contains where, and again, we're gonna do a little, little advanced uh, Swift, not like crazy advanced, but you know, more than the basics here. And we need to pass in a closure here. So dollar sign zero uh, dot uh, board index equals equals uh, index. Now, if you're not familiar with this line of code, let me kind of walk you through it. So basically I am going through my moves array that I pass in. So we're gonna pass in again, this, this array that we're kind of holding all of our moves and we're gonna check it. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna to look to see if this dollar sign zero means for each individual element in the array. So for all the moves or the nils in the array, uh, well, if it's nil, this optional just won't even trigger. So it's really only gonna check the actual moves in the array. If that move.board index equals equals the index that we pass in, so we're gonna pass in a specific index that we wanna check. If that does contain it, then return true. That's an occupied square. If you know this never happens, then it's not occupied, it is free to go. So hopefully that made sense. Uh, you'll see how we'll use it here. So in the on tap gesture, we can use it uh, like if is uh, square occupied in, again, we're gonna pass in moves. And for index, 
I, because it's whatever one we tapped. Remember, our tap gesture is on the Z stack, and each Z stack is each individual square. So basically, well, if that's true, we want to return. So essentially what we're saying here, this is kind of like a, a line in the sand. If the square is occupied in our moves array for the index that we tapped, just return, don't execute any code below this. Essentially nothing is going to happen. So let's actually test that out here on our iPhone 12 Pro here. So you can see, I'm gonna go middle square and X. Now, before when I would tap and I get a circle and then X, so I should get a circle here. But now when I'm tapping middle square, nothing happens. Now when I'm tapping this square, nothing happens because we're, we're checking that to make sure it's occupied. It's an occupied square, you can't do anything. Now, this one's not occupied. Cool, it's there. Okay, so our check to see if a square is occupied is working. Next, we're gonna write the code to have our computer player actually make the move itself, so I don't have to tap for X's and circles. Uh, and then we're gonna create our very easy AI, which is super basic, which is essentially just pick a random square that's not occupied, right? <laughs> no, no logic in tic-tac-toe, just any occupied square, put it at random. That's our very easy AI, so let's start doing that. So for that, we're going to create another function uh, below is square occupied. And again, all these functions are gonna get refactored out into the view model, uh, but the func is gonna be called determine computer move position. And we wanna say in move, so we have to like determine it within this moves, because again, we gotta check to see uh, if it's available, which is an array of moves. And we're gonna return an int, uh, right? Because we wanna return, say, hey, once we've figured out what position we want, here's the position to put the circle in, right? This is kind of the computer playing uh, itself. So first let's create a, a variable called move position. And that is gonna equal just a random integer. Again, uh, int dot random, and we're gonna do zero up and two, but not including nine. That'll give us zero through eight. That's what our uh, grid maps out to. So here's us just, hey, a random position. But once we have that position, we have to make sure it's not occupied, right? We can't just occupy something there's already an X at. So we're gonna use the handy dandy function we just wrote up here on line 50. Uh, we're gonna say, if is square occupied, right, in moves, right, this whole moves array is basically our whole game, uh, for index move position, right, because we want to basically check against this random position, right? So we're gonna basically roll the dice, a nine-sided dice. Uh, if we get eight, okay, let's check to make sure eight is not occupied. So if, if it is occupied, so if this returns true, uh, we're gonna do the same thing again here. We're going to basically, Command C and Command V, uh, update this. But this won't quite work, right? Because this if statement's only gonna run once. So we wanna create a while loop here. So say while is square occupied. So basically what's gonna happen is this is going to run and if the square is occupied, it's going to basically uh, change the move position to another random number. It's gonna run it again. And then as soon as this equates to false, then it will exit the while loop and continue. And once it does, that means we have a good move position so we can return move position, right? So again, to really sum this up, we're just getting a random number, checking to make sure that we're, we're not on an occupied square. And then if we're not on an occupied square, uh, return that move position, which is an integer, um, which is what we're gonna say, hey computer, move to this integer, essentially what we're trying to figure out right here. Now, this function, this looks short and easy. This is gonna get, uh, there's gonna be a lot going on here because this is where we're going to build out our AI to be a lot more difficult, right? We wanna check to see if they can win. And if they can win, they make that move. Then we wanna check to see if they can block. And if they can block, okay, make the blocking move. And then, you know, if they can't win, they can't block, okay, now take the middle square. And if they can't win, they can't block, they can't take the middle square, now do a random one. So that's, we'll get more into that later, but that's the overview of like our AI and we're gonna code uh, all that up. So now that we know how to determine just our basic uh, AI's position, which is just a random square that's not occupied, in our tap gesture, how we're gonna do this here, okay, so we no longer need uh, the if is human turn dot toggle, get, get rid of uh, that. Um, yep, is human's turn, got, get rid of that. You're gonna see, cause we're gonna create another one of these for uh, computers, but I wanna make sure I, I don't forget to get rid of that. And yep, get rid of this uh, is humans equals true state uh, property. Again, that was just temporary to test it to show you the UI. So now what happens on tap, right? And, and again, this is gonna get refactored as well because we're gonna have a lot initially in this on tap gesture. But uh, now that we have our human move, right? If the human was able to make a successful move, well, here's where later on we'll do our whole, you know, check for win condition uh, or draw, right? Because you can draw on tic-tac-toe. If you have two good players, you're probably gonna draw all the time. So we're gonna do that later. Uh, but first let's kind of get our computer making their own move. So the behavior we want, as soon as a player taps one of our circles, there's gonna be like a half second delay and then the computer's gonna make a move. 
Now, the reason I chose to do that was instead of doing it instantaneously, that's kind of confusing for the user, right? Imagine if like the instant, because it's a computer, right? The instant you tap the button, the other circle showed up and it would just kind of look weird. So I put a half second delay in there just to make it look like the other player was like making a move. Um, that's just kind of like a, a UI UX type thing I chose to do. Dispatch, uh, q.main.async after, and then uh, yeah, deadline is dot now and then uh, plus this is where we're putting in our delay right 0 0.5 so that's half a second uh, delay here and then we don't need that we can just do that and then put our closure there so now this is where after 0.5 seconds we're going to have our computer make a move now hopefully if you're a little bit experienced you may notice that you know by delaying half a second well what if the user just immediately taps another circle you're kind of breaking things we're going to address that but let's get our computer making its move first so basically after half a second uh, from our player makes their move we want to essentially do the same thing except for the computer player so uh, here we're going to say let uh, computer position uh, equals determine this is where we're going to use our function that we wrote down here right we wrote this determine computer move position right now it's just a random number but again that that function is going to get a little more uh, evolved here in we got to pass in our moves there we go so that is going to spit out a random int that's not occupied right all that work is happening down here uh, in this function so once we have our computer position we want to uh, do the same thing we did up here for the human. In fact, I'm gonna copy and paste this just to make sure you know you don't mess it up. So Command C, oh, I forgot to have the uh, parentheses at the end there. And then down here, uh, Command V. So see, moves uh, at I, which again is not what we want, right? Because we don't wanna put it wherever, I is whatever we tapped. But here we want uh, computer position, right? Because the computer determined its own position, right? It got that random number. So at the index, you know, so if the computer said, I want to go to index nine or eight, whatever, that's where we're, we're putting it here. And then the move uh, is not a human move. It is a computer move. And the board index, again, is uh, computer uh, position. I'm going to make my thing smaller there so we can see this better. Okay, so again, the behavior here is once we tap a button, we're going to put our move in as long as the square isn't occupied. Then we're going to wait half a second and then the computer is going to determine their random move. And then it's going to be my turn again. That's going to be the, the flow of things that you'll see here. So let's run this and try. Again, we will handle the, uh, the, the player like double tapping uh, real quick, but we're going, to, we're going to play fair and just wait. Okay, I'm going to try to go to the upper right. There's my X. Where's the circle? Okay, let's check our uh, determine computer move uh, position. Hmm. Okay. I should have looked at the warnings. Duh. That, that was super obvious. So small mistake I made, right? So you can see it says variable move position was never mutated, right? Well, of course we want to mutate that move position. So I accidentally created a brand new variable here. So this isn't working correctly. I'm picking a random number. I'm creating a brand new move position, right? So that's where that error was. Because what I want to do in this while loop is update the existing move position. That's how, that's how while loops work. Uh, so anyway, that var right there is messed up make sure you delete that now we should be uh working right because i want to keep continue updating you know this move position on row 59 not creating you know a new one every time okay so put the x in the upper left circle there uh we'll put the well i'm going to try to let this thing beat me put the x here circle there x here uh, I, guess, I guess not okay so you see we're playing some tic-tac-toe uh there's no win condition normally you should see an alert here uh we got to check for all the win conditions and stuff but you can see our computer is, and I have to like rerun the thing to restart. We'll implement a whole restart game thing. But you can see Circle's making its own moves, uh, just picking a random uh, spot. So pretty cool. We're, we're starting to get there with our game. Now let's handle the issue of, you know, if I were to like double tap, I, I would mess everything up because there is that half second delay here that, you know, we're just kind of like pausing. Well, what I want to do is basically as soon as I tap the button as the human, I want to disable the board. So on my V stack, right, which is basically like the whole screen here, uh, we got this right here, right, where the padding is. I want to do uh, dot disabled, and I need to pass in a Boolean here. Well, let's go up here and make a state variable because we're going to be flipping this variable back and forth. Uh, at state private var uh, is game uh, board disabled. That is going to equal false to start. And then uh, basically, as soon as I tap it, I want to set is game board disabled uh, equal to true 
and then after the so for 0.5 seconds it's going to be disabled that means the player can't tap it and then as soon as the player makes their or i'm sorry the computer makes their move i want to do is game board disabled equals false so we're, we're flipping it back and forth uh and then in disabled here instead of just true i want it to be is game board uh disabled so if i test that real quick i should i'm going to try to do a quick little double tap and it, it shouldn't work the game board should be disabled so xx yep didn't work xx nope I'm trying to click all around super fast. It's not, it's not working. <laughs> so, okay, so we, we took care of that little little potential bug. And that's something you gotta look out for when you're putting in like delays like that. Cause you know, user could quickly double tap. So we handled the game board disabled. We have our uh, computer playing very dummy, <laughs> a dumb game. It's a dumb AI, but we're going to make that a better AI. But first let me talk about today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace, and that's great because the whole purpose of this video is to help you build a portfolio project. So Squarespace is a great way to get that iOS developer portfolio up and running very quickly. Now I know as a developer, you may wanna try to build it yourself. We all have that inclination, but it's a lot of work to build and maintain your own website. You have you know, mobile, iPads, the giant iMac that I'm looking at right now, all the various screen sizes are a pain in the butt to implement, not to mention all the different browser compatibilities. It's just, it's a headache and a lot of time to maintain and build your own website. So that's why I say, let Squarespace take that off your plate, let them do it for you. They have tons of beautiful themes. They do all the SEO and the analytics. Again, it's just a stress that you don't have to deal with with your iOS developer portfolio or even like a website for your app. So when you're ready to build that website, go to squarespace.com. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Sean Allen to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Okay, so we have our dumb AI playing the game. Before we make that AI pretty smart and pretty good at tic-tac-toe, let's actually put in these win conditions, right? Because as you saw, every time I played a game, I have to like stop and rerun the simulator, all that stuff. So we're gonna actually check for wins and then put in the ability to reset the game. That way we have like a working tic-tac-toe with a pretty stupid AI. And then all we have to do is to finish up the project is, you know, work on uh, making our AI smarter. So for that, we need to write another function. Uh, so you can see there's, there's a lot of functions going on here, which again is why we're going to refactor that. So under determine uh, computer move position, we'll do uh, func check win uh, condition and then we'll do four and we'll pass in a player, which is of type player, right? Cause we got to see if the human one or the computer one and then in uh, moves, which again is our array of move, which is optional. Cause again, it can have nils. Again, this array of moves is essentially our a representation of our game board. And that returns a Boolean. Uh, cause we're gonna see basically return, we're gonna hit return true just so uh, Xcode doesn't yell at me before we write our uh, code in. And now for the sake of time, I'm gonna copy and paste in uh, some quick win condition code. I'll explain it. It's not a lot of code. I just don't think you wanna watch me type out the tediousness of it. Now, before I do that, I forgot to actually return the Boolean. Um, not sure what happened there. But now if I do a command B, all errors should be gone. Good to go. Okay, so we I wanna bring in the win conditions, right? I'm gonna paste this here. Like I said, I brought this in, but I'll explain it. So I call this win patterns, right? And it is a set of sets. So a set is similar to an array, except it's unordered. Uh, you can have direct lookup. Uh, it's much more efficient when trying to do what we're doing, even though this is a small data set, it probably wouldn't have mattered. Uh, but anyway, so a set of a set, like you see, it's, it's, I'm just gonna call it an array for ease of explanation. So it's like, if it's like an array, and then you have arrays within an array, right? So an array of arrays. And these are the win conditions, um, right? So in order to win, you have to be at zero, one, two, right? So zero, one, two would be across the top. You see over here, zero, one, two. And then three, four, five, that would be across the middle, six, seven, eight, across the bottom, et cetera. And then all the diagonals. So these are all the, basically the series of, of board indexes that will create a win is what this is, right? So this is every single win condition. There's only eight of them, uh, but that's what this is, right? So to explain that, feel free to pause the video, type that out. Uh, I feel like this video is gonna be long enough. So I wanted to kind of cut time there. Okay, so what I wanna do to check against these uh, win conditions is first I gotta start pulling out uh, a certain player's moves from our moves array that we passed in. Again, the representation of our game board. So I'll say let player moves uh, equal moves. And the first thing we gotta do though, and again, you may not be familiar with like map, compact map filter. You're gonna get a little exposure here. Uh, Moves.compactMap. And then again, we're gonna pass in a, a closure here and it's going to be dollar sign zero for each you know, item uh, in there. And I can delete that actually. 
And basically what play this does is compact map removes all the nils. Again, our moves array can have moves or nil. Well, this basically gets rid of all the nils and just give me the moves. Okay, so now in player moves, all I have is basically all the moves without the nils. So now after that, I can do a filter. I can kind of chain these together, dot filter. And again, another uh, closure like we had before. And then now with, within the not, all the nils removed, I wanna do dollar sign uh, zero dot player uh, is equal to whatever player we passed in. I gotta type better, right? So the player we passed in is, is right here. So if we pass in a human, what this line of code is doing is it is removing all the nils from moves and then we're filtering out all the human, right? So give me all the non-nil human moves. And if I pass in computer, give me all the computer moves, right? So now once I have all these moves like isolated, now I can check them against all these win conditions. But there's actually one more step because I have the moves, right? I can't check a move, like, because a move is a whole object that is a player, an indicator, all that stuff against just an integer. So I need to yank out just my board index on the move, right? So that way I can compare integer to integer. So we're kind of just parsing uh, these arrays real quick. So now I want to say let player positions uh, equal, we're going to create a new set here because uh, we're going to use that later, player uh, moves, basically this on line 76, what I just created, my, my filtered thing, dot map, and again, another filter, uh, another closure, I'm sorry. You're getting some exposure to, to filter map and all that good stuff. Uh, so what I wanna do is give me all the dollar sign zero, which again is every element in the uh, array, uh, board index. So let me, let me review this because I know a lot of people aren't familiar with, with these uh, this kind of code here. So what I am essentially doing is Again, player moves is removing all the nils and then filtering out whatever player I passed in. And then this player positions set is basically, okay, go through all the player moves and now just give me all the board indexes, right? So now player positions is just, it'll look like this. It'll be like zero, one, eight, right? It's where all the X's would be in the case of a human, where all the circles would be, right? But it's just a set of integers. And the reason we're doing a set is because that's how we're going to compare against the win patterns. Basically what we're gonna say is, hey, go through uh, all these different sets of win patterns. And if this win pattern is a subset of my player moves, basically that means, hey, if my set of player positions has a zero, a one, and a two in it, hey, that means I have a win. If it has a one, a four, and a seven in it, okay, I have a win. So that's how I'm checking all the win conditions. So let's write the code for that. For pattern in win patterns, again, I'm iterating through all my win patterns, uh, where pattern dot is sub, oh no, I'm not getting autocomplete, of uh, uh, player position. I'm just gonna try to brute force this. I don't know why I'm not getting autocomplete here. Maybe, maybe you all are. And then we'll do uh, uh, command B, still getting in there. Well, I have an extra P in there. Command B, still getting in there. No, that worked, okay. Not sure if you ran into autocomplete issues there, like I did, uh, who, who knows with Xcode sometimes, but let me explain this line of code here, right? So we're iterating through our win patterns and then during that iteration, wherever the pattern, which again, a pattern is one of these, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's a pattern, uh, is a subset of my player positions. So like I said before, if my player positions were, you know, two, four, six, eight, then yeah, it's a subset, right? So I win, that's how we're checking the wins. So if that is the case, uh, here we are, I like to put this on one, one, uh, one line, if it's super simple, return true. So the win condition is true if uh, you know the win condition pattern is a subset of my player uh, positions. And then basically if, if it goes through that whole iteration and nothing happens, then we return false. There is no win condition. Okay, that was a lot. Let me do one super fast run through, right? Here's all our win patterns. We are basically parsing out our array to just get uh, you know, my board indexes for that player. And then we are going to basically have this set of board indexes and we're gonna check to see if any of these win conditions are a subset of my player positions. If that's true, we have a win. If it's false, we don't have a win and we're gonna move on. <laughs> so back to our kind of game here on the tap gesture, right under our comment that says check for win condition or draw. So let's say uh, if check for win condition for human, right? Cause this is after our human taps it. Basically the human move is up here. The computer move is in our dispatch main.async, right? So uh, for dot human in moves. And then if that is true, uh, for now we're just gonna print, 
<laughs> uh, human wins. We're gonna have alerts and all that stuff later, but for now. So let's copy this too, because we have to check it after the computer moves, right? So let's check it here, but except we wanna check the win condition for the computer, not the human, and then we'll say computer uh, wins. Great, so let's run this and test this out. I'll kind of move this, uh, well, I'll, I'll move this over here so you can see the printout. Okay, I'm gonna beat this real quick, right? X, X. Bam. Okay, see, it printed human wins. If the, the game is still playing because we haven't like stopped it. We'll, we'll do that later, but you can see in the printout, human wins. Um, I don't, I'm gonna try this once. I'm gonna try to get this dumb AI to beat me. It's pretty hard. We'll see what it, if I can make it happen. Uh, I'm only gonna try it once. Okay, there you go. There's your, there's your spot. Circle, come on. Ah, uh, there you go. See, computer wins, right? I let it win. So there you go. Our win conditions are working. Okay, let's stop this and now let's do our draw conditions. That one's actually uh, kind of easy here. So under uh, check win condition, let's create a funk check for uh, draw in moves. And again, we're gonna pass in that array of uh, move. And again, just like the win condition, we are returning a Boolean. And this one's kind of easy, one line of code. So what we wanna do is uh, return moves, right? Dot compact map, remember. So let me tell you the logic before we write this code. I don't wanna, I got ahead of myself. Essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna run compact map to remove all the nils, right? Cause remember our array is just nine objects. Uh, it can be nine nils, it could be a mix of moves and nils. So I wanna do compact map to remove all the nils. And after I do that, if the count of that is nine, that means I have nine moves. So that means the game's over and there's a draw, right? Because we're gonna check for the draw after we check for win conditions, right? So if we check for win condition, there's no win condition, but all nine moves have been made, that's a draw. So let me write that out again. Uh, so return dot uh, moves dot compact map. And I don't do the autocomplete. Uh, again, just kind of do the, the closure here, uh, dollar sign zero, space that out a little bit, dot count uh, equals equals nine. So basically, if I remove all the nils and the count is equal to nine, it's gonna return true, because that's what this equates to. Uh, if it doesn't return nine, it's gonna return false. That means there was no draw. So again, the check for draw code, uh, pretty simple uh, when you write it using you know, compact map and all that stuff. So now let's check for draws up here in our uh, tap gesture after our um, human goes. So if check uh, for draw in moves, is true print you know draw and the same check goes down here after the computer makes their move and again we're so here's what if you're hopefully alarm bells are kind of going off thinking man this is this is like you know 40 whatever lines of code in a tap gesture on swift ui i get that we're going to refactor it out you definitely don't want to have all this kind of logic because it's confusing. Like, let's not even, let's not bullshit. It's confusing. <laughs> so we're going to refactor that and, and fix it. We're kind of spelling it all out uh, for now. So again, uh, let's try to get a draw here. Uh, I'm only going to try this once. We'll we'll test the draw thing on a on when we get the AI harder because it's easier to draw. I don't know if I can get this random uh, AI to draw. I guess I can just, yeah, I can. I can just sit here and block them all day and not try to win. Crap. Um, okay. It's hard to try to lose tic-tac-toe. Okay. No, that's a win. Damn it. <laughs> oh, but it, okay. So draw popped up because we're not like, I got to return after this. That's, that's what I forgot. So after I print win, I have to return. Uh, so nothing runs after I check the win condition. Or if, if the win condition is true, I return. If the draw is true, I return because we want that we want nothing to happen after that. Right. Uh, I forgot that. That's why the code kept running. But uh, anyway, you'll see the draw code work once once the AI gets a little harder. Before we start making that AI a little harder, let's actually put in our alerts so we can actually end the game and restart it. You'll see that'll make the testing much more easier. I don't have to stop the simulator uh, at all times and all that good stuff. So uh, a little intro into like Swift UI alerts. We'll do command N on the tic-tac-toe folder, new Swift file. We're gonna kind of have a new alert object here. We can call this uh, alerts. This is the way I do alerts in Swift UI, at least the, the super basic and simple ones. Um, obviously, if they get more complex, uh, you may have to mix it up a little bit. But uh, so I'm gonna import Swift UI here, create a new uh, struct called uh, alert item, and it's gonna conform to identifiable. You'll see why we have to do that uh, in a second. Or once we start uh, implementing these, let me get rid of this. I need all the space I can get. Um, you know, say it doesn't conform to alert uh, identifiable. That's because we need to do let uh, ID uh, equal UUID. Initialize that. Let's create a new UUID there. All right, I need some properties here. So var title 
It's going to be a text and var uh, message is also going to be a text that I pass in. Var button title is also going to be a text that I pass in. And then, so you'll, you'll see how we, I use this in a second, um, but let me create my uh, struct called alert context. You'll see how all this ties together and I'll come back and explain it uh, if you haven't seen this before. And here's where I will initialize these alert items. And you'll see, I'm gonna have one for each case and you'll see how this looks nice uh, at the call site, right? It may seem like a lot of extra work right now, but you, you'll, you'll see. And I'll explain it all when I'm done here. So I will say let human uh, win, tab it over, equals uh, alert item, which I the object I just created up there. See the title, uh, we'll say uh, you win, great. Uh, the message is, you are so smart. You beat your own AI. Make this say whatever you want. And then the button title, uh, we'll say, hell yeah. Okay, so that's that's one uh, alert item there. Oh, I'm sorry, I just put the strings there. I need to put the text here. And I, I wanted to pass in the text. Again, this makes the call site look a lot neater. And then speaking of neatness, let's go ahead and I, this is what I do when uh, when all the parameters start to get like really, really long, uh, then I, I put them on the next line. It's kind of like my rule of thumb. It all depends on like how it looks. So what I'm gonna do to save time now is copy that, do paste, paste, cool. And then this is not human win, this is computer win. And then this one is, you know, draw. And then I like, to, you know, I like to line my stuff up. We're gonna fix this all in a second. Uh, I guess it already is fixed. So now it's gonna say you lost. Uh, and it'll say you programmed uh, a super AI. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, and then the draw is, you know, I'll just say draw and we'll say, you know, what a battle of wits we have here. Dot, dot, dot. And then, uh, you know, we'll say try again for that button. And then for the you lost title, it says uh, rematch. Okay, you can make this say whatever you want. Uh, now, let's, let me show you how to use these, right? We did some heavy lifting here, right? Trying to type it all out here, but this way we're not cluttering up our Swift UI view that usually has a lot going on with all this like alert stuff. I like to kind of refactor that out. So back to our content view, let's actually uh, put these in action. Uh, so on our uh, V stack here, like where we have disabled padding, uh, we can do dot alert. And then you'll see here, we'll type alert. You see is presented or item. You've probably seen the is presented where you have a state variable like is presented as true or is presented as false and that's how you trigger it. Well, this one uses the item and you can see now uh, identifiable. That's why we conform to identifiable. So the item is actually, we need to create a state variable for that. So at state private var uh, alert item, that is of type alert uh, item, it's an optional. And now we can do for the binding to dollar sign alert item that we just created. And then we'll pass in the closure uh, alert item in. And then we'll space that out and hit return. And then in here is where I create my alert, right? This is where, and this is where it can be dynamic, right? I'm gonna pass in whatever our alert item is. So here I want to do a uh, title message dismiss button. And then you see for title, because I have access to the alert item, which we're going to update, you'll see here in a second. Uh, I can do alert item dot title. And like I said, this is where I was talking about how it's neat at the call site. I can do alert item dot message and then the dismiss button dot default. And actually let me do this here to make this look neater here because it's gonna get messy. So I like to leave the button kind of flexible because alerts, you know, sometimes there's two buttons, sometimes there's one button, sometimes there's an action on the button, sometimes there's not. In this case, there's gonna be an action on the button because we wanna reset the game once we hit that button. So we'll do default uh, with an action as you see there. So the label text is gonna be alert item dot button title. So I put that there. And then the action uh, is going to be a function we haven't written yet called reset game. So let's go down and write our reset game function down at the bottom below, uh, check for draw, func reset game. And this one is pretty simple. So remember our blank game board was just nine nils in our moves array up here. So essentially I kind of want to copy and paste and, and redo this whole thing. I want to set moves equal to uh, an empty array of nine nils and that kind of resets the game here. So we'll do moves equals that. Oops, I hit spotlight. Do command B to make sure I got no errors. 
Okay, so that's how we're gonna reset our game is just basically put all nils back in our moves. And then the action we're going to uh, pass in the closure uh, with reset game uh, right there. So pretty simple. So let me kind of, uh, well, actually we're not done with the alerts, sorry. So here, instead of printing human wins, right? I'm going to set my alert item. This is where it all comes together, right? So instead of printing that alert item equals alert uh, context dots, ah, I forgot. Okay, back to alerts. I forgot to make these all uh, static. Sorry about that, sorry for the confusion there. Go back to your alerts, make these uh, static variables and uh, you'd be good to go there. And then I'm gonna highlight these all and do a control I to like line everything up. Little little tip there if you weren't familiar with that. Okay, so now I can do alert context dot, there we go, human win, right? And then for the draw, I can do, alert item uh, equals alert context dot draw. And you can see when you're putting in your, so when you set it all up in that alert file, when you actually want to use your alerts, it's super simple and clean at the call site rather than having those alerts like, rather than having like all this type of code sprinkled all throughout your view. It just gets so cluttered and, and ugly in my opinion. Um, okay, so for the computer wins, uh, alert item equals uh, alert context dot computer win. And then I'll just copy and paste the draw one uh, down here. Okay, so let me walk through how these alerts are working, right? So we have this state variable called alert item. So anytime, you know, we get to this win condition, I set the alert item equal to the alert context.human win, which again, back in our alerts is this, this right here, I basically set all that information. And then because it's a state variable, anytime alert item changes, it kind of redraws the UI. And then now that I have the alert on the V stack, it is bound to that alert item. So once that alert item changes, it knows to show the alert and it has the alert item object. And then I just populate my alert with all the different you know, alert item properties. Uh, this is how you can show like multiple alerts on one screen by kind of making it reusable. And then all the alerts have the same action of resetting the game. So now let's try this. I'll try to win. We should see the alert when I win and I should be able to reset the game when I say, okay. And we're still on the dummy AI, so I, I shouldn't lose, right? Yeah, there we go. You win, you are so smart, you beat your own AI, hell yeah. And when I hit hell yeah, resets the game. Let's try to... Okay, uh, we didn't quite reset the game. I think I messed something up here in uh, where I'm doing my return after checking for win condition. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm disabling the game board up here, but then I check for my win conditions. I won and I return, so I never get the chance to turn the game board back on. So what I need to do, do a command X here, don't disable the game board until after I do all my like win condition, you know, draw condition checks. Okay, so let's test that out one more time here. Let's get a quick quick dub. I should go in the middle first. I don't know why I'm not doing it. Okay, cool. You win, hell yeah. Okay, go to the middle. All right, there we go. Now we're working. Boy, this, this AI is not very smart. Okay, cool. So we're working there. Uh, the app is working. Of course, we got a lot of refactoring to do, but let's make our AI smarter. Cause as you see, like it's not even a fun game. Like the AI just doesn't even try. So let's fix that. Okay, let's stop running this and let's focus on our uh, determine computer move position function. It's not a very big function right now. We're about to add a lot to it. Okay, so first let me put uh, these comments above it, right? Cause this really breaks down what we're trying to do for the AI. I said it real fast before, I'll say it again. So the first thing we want our AI to do is if you have the ability to win, take the spot, take the win. If you can't win, okay, now check for if the X can win. If the X can win, okay, now block. Then if you can't win, you can't block, right? It's like a series of instructions. If you can't win, if you can't block, okay, now take the middle square if it's open, right? That's strategically kind of like the next best thing you should do. And then if you can't win, you can't block, you can't take the middle square, okay, now just Take, take a random square. And this random square is what allows for mistakes. Cause as you know, two good players should, nobody should ever win in tic-tac-toe, it should just be a draw. But to make the game fun and not make an unbeatable AI, uh, add that randomness in there so the AI can make mistakes on this final level, which will make the AI smart, but not unbeatable. So let's actually take this piece by piece, right? I'm gonna copy that first part here and we'll put it there uh, and then actually put this because we already have like our last step that take a random position we already have that here with the last step so what we're going to do here is build uh these three steps here and you can see this is kind of like difficulty levels of an ai 
right? If you just wanted to have, hey, if you can win, take the win, if not go random, you know, that's gonna be a pretty easy AI. So you can see every step that we add makes the AI more difficult. So you can imagine you could really expand on this app to where you could allow the user, hey, select easy mode, medium, hard, and you can, you know, adjust the AI accordingly. Okay, so the first thing I'll need to check for like wins and blocks is kind of my win condi or my win patterns. Uh, I'm sorry, because we before we were checking to see if all three of them were included. Now we want to see if there's two out of three, right? Because if you have two out of three, that means there's a win available. Same thing for win blocking. If my opponent has two out of three, that means they have a win available. So that means I need to block that. So a little bit different than checking for the win condition, uh, but let's go ahead and do that. Okay, and we need the same code we wrote down here. We're gonna, again, we're gonna refactor this later. I'm kind of keeping this all spilled out for your ease of understanding in the beginning, but I need this uh, first here, except I wanna be specific, not on like player. I want, uh, I wanna make sure, whoop, no, for this computer. Uh, I want to see, uh, and I'll even name this differently, right? Uh, computer moves and computer positions. Uh, and we'll change this here. I know I could have done like edit all in scope, and chill with the keyboard shortcuts. But uh, anyway, so I want to get same thing we did down here in checking for win conditions. Basically, I'm removing all the nils from from the moves. I'm getting all the computer moves, and then I am going through all the computer moves and just getting a set of the board index. Same thing we did for checking with the, uh, the win condition. We just got to write a little bit different code to check for two out of three rather than all three, right? We can't do is a subset because that includes all of them. So same thing to start. Uh, I want to do four pattern in win patterns, right? Because I want to go through each one of these patterns and check to see if I have two out of three. So as I'm iterating through this, I can create a variable called uh, win positions, and that is an array that's going to equal pattern dot subtracting other sequence, uh, other set. We're going to uh, subtract the set here of computer uh, positions. Okay, so let me explain what I'm doing here. So for each pattern, where again, that's these one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, uh, I'm uh, creating a array or another set, I'm sorry, of possible win positions, right? And what I'm doing is I'm taking this pattern and I am subtracting my computer positions, right? So I have, say the pattern is zero, one, two, but in my computer positions, I only have a zero. So I'm subtracting that zero out from zero, one, two, right? Anything that kind of like intersects. So that means my win positions will be one and two. Well, if there's two of them, that means I don't have a chance at a win, right? I need to do this when the count is only one, right? If I do this subtracting and there's only one left in the win condition, that means that's my move. That's where I gotta go to get the win if it's available. So that's what this does. This gives me a set of the, it, it, but it can be, you know, three of them, two of them, one of them. So I wanna make, check to make sure it's only one because that means I can win. So if win, positions uh, dot count uh, equals equals one. And if the count is one, well, now I gotta make sure it's available, right? I, I, if it's not available, I can't use it. So let uh, is available uh, equal, here's where we're gonna use our is square occupied in moves, right? We pass that in. Uh, for index, we wanna check the uh, win positions dot first. Right? And we can force unwrap this because we know there's one because we have a count of one in there. And we can do the first one because there's only one. Uh, so now, except this is gonna tell me if it's occupied, right? Is square occupied? So I wanna use the bang in front you know, to be not, right? To flip that. So if the square is not occupied, now I have uh, is available equals true, right? So this is gonna be true, this is a Boolean. So now I wanna say if is available, then I'm going to return and it's basically this win positions dot first, right? Whatever that position was, if it's available, that's what I wanna return, uh, let's take it, right? And when, when we're returning here, now this, this whole function of determine computer move positions is returning, right? We found our position. So anything below this isn't gonna run, right? We're not gonna find a random position because we, we've got our position. So you're gonna see me returning out of this function a couple different times based on if we found our position. Okay, so let's test this out, right? This, this dummy AI is getting a little smarter. Now, if it has an opportunity to win, it should take it right away. Okay, so I'm gonna take the, the worst squares, or at least try to, try to not affect their, their win here. Okay, they have a win condition, right? A lower left. So I'm gonna pick this one. They took the lower left, you lost, you programmed a super AI. Great, that win condition is working. I always like to test things twice just to make sure like, you know, I, I didn't get lucky. Uh, let's see here. Okay, their circle is their win condition. See if they get it. Got the win condition, we lost. Okay, so that is working. Now, the blocking is very similar, right? Because remember, it's just my, my uh, if I have two out of the three, 
wind conditions, or I'm sorry, not wind conditions, but uh, wind patterns. So I'm gonna essentially just copy and paste this code. And again, we're gonna refactor later, uh, but it's essentially the same. Uh, we just gotta switch it out for the player. So now it's under the, uh, if I can't win, then block uh, comment here. So instead of computer moves, call this uh, human moves and command C, and I'm just renaming this here. And then uh, instead of dot computer, I want dot human, right? We wanna check the human moves. And then instead of calling this computer positions, call this human positions. And again, copy, we're gonna change this from computer positions to human, basically anywhere you see computer, change it to the human one. So now the logic is the same. I'm going through the array of moves, uh, getting rid of all the nils, filtering out just for all, give me all the human moves. And then once I have all the human moves, now I'm gonna create a set of just their board indexes. Again, so I get something similar to my win conditions that I can check against. We go through those win patterns. And then basically, like I said, we're gonna subtract out uh, human positions. So one more example, let's say uh, my human position, I have like three, four, seven, and eight on the board. Well, when I subtract that out for this win pattern, I subtract out three and four, now I only have a five. So now my win positions dot count equals one. So that means I, there's an availability to win. Uh, so again, we make sure that square is available. Let is available, uh, you know, not square occupied in the moves for that uh, win positions dot first. Again, same code we just did before. If that space is available, that's the position I want uh, the computer to take. In the end, we're returning, so nothing below this gets executed. Okay, so run that. It was a lot of copying and pasting. Um, now we should block. It should check to see if it can win, but if it can't win, it should check to see if it can block. So now I'm gonna try to win. So put it in the middle. Okay, so now it should block me in the upper left. There it did, it blocked. Okay, now I'm gonna go over here and it should try and win. There you go, it won on the left. Try that one more time. Okay, in the circle there. Okay, it should block me on the right, it blocks me. It should block me again in the lower left. Cool, and then now it should block me in the upper left. Cool, and now we tied, draw. There you go. So that's pretty smart AI, right? It's gonna win if it can, block if it can't. One little extra level to this AI is if it can't win, it can't block, but if the middle square is available, take the middle square, right? That's the most valuable piece of real estate. So code to get take the middle square is quite simple, actually. Okay, for this, we're just gonna use the is square available, right? So if is uh, square occupied, uh, actually, except this one, remember it's not, because we wanna know if it's available, not if it's occupied, so you just put the not in there. In moves, uh, for index, four. Um, now we're gonna clean this up a little bit. If that square is available, then I wanna return four, right? That's the position I wanna take. If four is available, take four. Uh, however, four is what's called like a magic number, meaning like somebody reading your code later or maybe you six months later might not know what four kind of means, even though it is kind of obvious middle square. But in general, for these like magic numbers, you should kind of say, let center uh, square equals four, and then now use uh, center square instead of four. It just makes it more readable so people know exactly what's going on. So if is square occupied, you know, for center square, return the, the, the center square here. Okay, so let's run this again, test this real quick. And uh, I'm not, so my, we'll just test this right away. So my first move is not gonna be the center square. They should always go to the center square if I don't take it, cool. And they should block me, I'm gonna block them, I'm gonna block them. I'm gonna block them. So now our, our AI has its four steps, it's pretty done. So now it's gonna be tricky to beat. We have to rely on that randomness to make a mistake in the last step. So now I'm gonna try to win, right? X, I'll try to get him two ways here. Okay, yep, so, uh, no, now I, I did get him. Okay, so it's not unbeatable, but again, you're gonna tie a lot of the times as well. So that is it, that is our AI. Let's kind of walk through this real quick because the AI can be tricky. So yes, let's check for the win. And again, how we're doing that big picture is we're just basically extracting all the indexes for a certain player, comparing them against the win patterns and acting accordingly, doing the same thing uh, if we can block. And again, we're gonna refactor this can block and can uh, win in like the same function because they're super similar, right? And then you can see how easy it is just to take the center square and then take a random position. So that's a basic, you know, tic-tac-toe uh, AI. Now, if you don't care about the refactoring, we're done, you have your app. I recommend you stick around for the refactoring and the re-architecting in the model view view model. Uh, there's a lot of good insights in there. And because as you can see, like if this is your code, uh, this is this is like hard to read code. I mean, it's not terrible. I've seen much worse, <laughs> but uh, it's just a lot going on on this one view. And you'll see once we create our view model and refactor things out and write things nicer, uh, you're gonna you're gonna appreciate how how good it looks. All right, refactor time. One of my favorite things to do in the world is refactor and make things look look neater.
So uh, the first thing we're gonna do, uh, click on content view, uh, right click, refactor, rename, and then also if you click this little uh, plus button here, you have to like hover over content view, hit the plus button, that way it renames the comment as well. Uh, we're just gonna rename this game view rather than content view. Hit the rename button in the upper right. I like to do a command B just to make sure things are copacetic. Uh, in our tic-tac-toe folder here on the left, do a command N, we're gonna create a new Swift file as we're gonna create our view model. So we're gonna call it game view model. And the whole idea here, just in case you're not familiar with, with the view model in MVVM, is if I go back here is, our game view should be nothing but UI. Should be very straightforward and simple to understand what's going on. And then all this logic, right? All this, what happens on the tap gesture, all these functions, like all the logic should be in the view model. That's where all like the, the, the business happens, right? The UI should be really simple to read. And you'll see it's, it's very easy to kind of like understand what's going on on the screen. Okay, so in our view model here, we're gonna import Swift UI. And this is a class, right? So final class. Final just means you can't subclass it. So unless you plan on subclassing your view model, which you shouldn't, uh, make it final. Call it game view model. And it is going to be an observable, uh, not observed, be careful, observable uh, object that's in Swift UI. So basically what this means is anytime things change, just like our state variable in game view, uh, it's gonna publish uh, an update, and you're gonna see how this all comes together. Okay, so that is the, the basic structure. Let's start yanking things out of our game view into our view model. So back to game view. Well, first thing is this columns. I said from minute one, that was that was gone. Uh, but that is going into our uh, game model, game view model, I'm sorry. There you go, same thing. And then now in game view, we're gonna do a command B. I'm gonna get rid of my canvas here, uh, just temporarily, we'll, we'll bring it back. So now what you have to do, well, first of all, I gotta, I gotta connect my, my view model to my game view. Should have done that before I, I deleted that, but whatever, it's fine. So state object, this is new in iOS 14, uh, private var view model, so we're gonna call it, and that equals game view model, and we're gonna initialize a new one. So state object is similar to state variable, right? SwiftUI is gonna maintain this class uh, so we can make changes to it and update. That's why all kind of like your, your data lives there is because it's a class. Whereas like in SwiftUI, everything's a struct that gets like destroyed and recreated. So your data may not persist. Well, game view model, as we saw here is a class. So your data is gonna persist here uh, in memory. So that's why you wanna do this here. So it's a state object. Uh, but now in order to access anything on our game view model, we have to preface it with view model. So here we can't just go for columns. We have to go for view model dot columns and now you know everything works fine uh some people like to do just instead of typing out view model i have seen people you know do vm like they'll, they'll name this vm just like that and then that way you don't have like it's kind of shorter in the middle i i like to type it out to be honest with you but it's personal preference if you want to make it short and do that cool but i like to actually like type it out so the next thing we're gonna do is move all these state variables over. Again, you're gonna see how nice and neat our view is and how easy to read. So yank out all these state variables into our game view model, uh, put them here. And now, but they can't be state, right? Uh, Cause that is a, a Swift UI struct thing. So they need to be at uh, published, right? And I'll, I'll explain this here in a second. So command C, command V, command V, cool. And then they can't be private either, right? Private means you're restricted to that file. Uh, we want to access our view model stuff from our view so they can't be private so publish var so again anytime alert item changed publish is going to fire off and anything on game view that's listening to that published or accessing that will update so that's kind of the connection that's being made if something is marked published right because we want that we want anytime is game board disabled to change we want to update our ui same thing with our moves array so now the next thing we're going to do in game view is uh yank out all of our functions um Right, remember I said all these functions uh, can go, so command X. And you're, you're gonna get some errors in the meantime. We're gonna come back and fix that. <laughs> Anytime you're in the middle of a refactor, you, you break things. So now all of our functions are over here, right? We got our is square occupied. We have our determined computer move positions, you know, check win condition, check for draw, all that stuff, reset game all here and this is this uh, a lot of this works right away because the stuff we're accessing like our well a lot of stuff is getting passed into the function so you don't really need access to it but you know all of our variables are also over here uh, as well so the other thing we're going to bring over in game view uh so you see it's starting to get smaller but what what is the last remaining like chunk of code here right it's all this stuff in the on, on the tap gesture right we want that to to be more readable 
So I'm gonna call this something like process player move. Um, what, what I initially thought I wanted to do, I wanted to have a function called like process human player move, which is all this stuff, and then process computer player move, which is all this stuff. But you'll notice the way this works is we return at various levels based on like, like it's like a waterfall, right? Like you have to pass this check to get to this check. You have to pass this check to get to this check. You have to pass this to get to this. So you can't really like separate it out. So what we can do is uh, make sure I'm in the right stuff here. Yep, I can do a command X to get rid of all that. And in our game view model, I'm gonna put this uh, at the top as well. Uh, we're gonna do func uh, process player move and we need to pass in the position. So for uh, position, right? Because remember, we, we used I a lot on our tap gesture. We need to know which one we tapped. So I'm gonna need to you know, pass that through here. So int, and then I'm going to, uh, and then I'm gonna command V to paste all that in. And this should kind of like come over nice and neat, oh, or not. <laughs> um, okay, what, what happened here? Uh, oh, okay, so I, right? So that's what I need to do. I called it position instead of I, because I felt like that made more sense. So anywhere I used I, I need to, uh, paste in position. I know I, I, okay, you're probably yelling at me like, oh, do edit all in scope, do that, do that. And I, I always like forget to do that. <laughs> um, anyway, so what I'm missing here now in the game view is I got to call this, right? So I got to call view model dot process player. Okay, I'm not getting autocomplete. All these errors are swift UIs bugging out. Um, okay, let's fix the game model cause, or this view model because this should work. I don't know what's going on here. Okay, yeah, so Basically, because I'm in this dispatchq.main.async uh, um, closure, it's saying I need self. But new in, I think Swift 5.3, it might be new in. Uh, if I click this, like fix it, you can see I can capture self explicitly to enable implicit self in this closure. So instead of writing self everywhere in all this code, I can basically capture self up here in a capture list. And let me do command B to get rid of some of these errors. I'm still gonna have some errors, I think, or not. Um, now I don't have to have like self dot is game board disabled, self dot alert item. So you know what I mean? Because I'm capturing it uh, explicitly in here. And you may be wondering, oh, why not weak self? Um, I believe when you do you know dispatch these dispatch queues, um, you don't have to do weak self. 98% sure on that. Somebody could double check me, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you don't have to. So where are my three errors now? Nothing in my view model. Must be back in my game view. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So uh, what I want to do here is on tap gesture. Hopefully I get some auto complete. I want to say process player, or I got to do view model, I forgot. View model dot process player. Okay, they're not doing that for me. Let me fix these other errors uh, before I do that. So basically what I need to do, I'm going to copy the view model and I need to just paste view model dot in front of everything. So view model dot alert item, uh, view model dot reset game. Oh, and here I have moves up here in the image. So view model dot moves. Okay, now I got all my syntax highlighting back. Hopefully Xcode is not mad at me anymore. Hopefully I get some autocomplete now in the tap gesture. Help me out, view model, uh-oh, dot pro, there we go. Process player move for I. Remember I said we were passing in the I based on like whatever one we tapped. So do command B to get rid of these errors. So now we're, we're almost done, almost done with the refactor. But you can see, well, I got to do some cleanup. That's the thing. Every time you refactor, always, always go back and like make sure your spacing's lined up, like things aren't like all crazy out of whack. Um, but you can see now, this is our view now. Uh, it's getting getting nice and short. We're going to refactor a little bit more. But now with this on tap gesture, let me refactor these two images real quick so you can see the final refactor. And then I will explain my philosophy on refactoring and why it's so valuable. So, okay, so this circle here, uh, right, is the, I can pull out my canvas again now that we kind of got all this clutter out of the way. Uh, hit resume. So this circle, right, is our red circle or square, or whatever you made it, right? I can refactor this out. By the way, if you command click on circle, hit extract sub view, that'll do some refactoring for you. Uh, you got to rename it. So we'll name this game square view, even though it's a circle. I'm going to call it a square because people know tic-tac-toe is like squares, but whatever. Um, but you can see I need to pass in my geometry, right? Because th this relies on the geometry reader. So what I need to do is have a variable on this var uh, proxy. The reason I'm calling it proxy, you'll see, is because that geometry that I pass in is of type geometry proxy, right? Just I just know that without going into a full lesson on geometry readers, uh, that's what it is. So now instead of uh, geometry.size, I can do proxy.size. Again, same thing, just a refactor. But now when I use game square view up here, you see it gave me extracted view. I need to change this to game 
let me actually get rid of that, square view, and you can see it's gonna say, hey, I need a proxy. Well, the proxy, remember, just geometry that we have up here on our geometry reader, geometry. There we go. And then now, same thing uh, for this image. Again, command click on image, uh, extract subview, and down here, it, it always puts it at the bottom. Now I can have, I'll call it player uh, indicator, right? And I'm gonna need a var uh, system image name, which is a string, right? Because that's what we pass in for the uh, SF symbols. So instead of all this like view model moves I indicator or, uh, well, I'm gonna copy that because I'm gonna need to, to pass that in, um, but it's gonna be system image name right now. So that is our player indicator, right? We pass in whatever system image name we want. It's resizable, it has all the modifiers. So up here, uh, instead of extracted view, again, we do uh, player uh, indicator and then initialize it. And you see, I need a system image name and I'm gonna do a command V because it's the same logic we had, right? It's gonna look at our view model, uh, the moves. And if, if there is a move at that position, go ahead and use the indicator. If there's not a move at that position, just put a blank uh, right there. So now our view is looking you know, pretty clean, right? We have our, our grid zero to nine, that's our tic-tac-toe board. We have our Z, in the tic-tac-toe board, we have our Z stack, which is a game square view. And then a player indicator view on top of that Z stack, which is our X or O or blank. And then when you tap one of these, you process player move. So now that I've kind of like talked through that, this is why I like to have my Swift UI views, you know, like this, uh, you could probably even argue that you could, you could almost like um, refactor out this entire like grid into something as well and just call it tic-tac-toe grid. Sometimes you can take this too far, but my point is I like to have this read as like a table of contents, right? Because just looking at this, I can see the lazy V grid zero to nine. I can see the Z stack. I can see what happens on tap gesture. Like I get a big picture view or an understanding, especially when I have the canvas right next to it as to like what's going on on the view. And then I can choose if I'm curious about, oh, how do you process player moves? Okay, there you go. And I can command click on process player moves, jump to definition. And now here I am. Now I can dig into that if I choose, right? And I can kind of like slowly dig. But all that code is not out here cluttering everything being so confusing, right? Again, it's a table of contents. You give the reader of your code all the chapters and say, which chapter do you want to explore? And you know, by seeing all the chapters like this, they can get an understanding of what's going on. If they choose to explore deeper, uh, they can. So let's kind of review this real quick. Yep, we have our player, our move down here. And you could, if you wanted to take this further, you know, you could like refactor this out into a new file called like model or a new folder called model. You know, these could be re uh, moved out into, you know, a file called custom views or, you know what I mean? You can organize your, your project however you want. They don't all have to be in here. Um, and then yeah, the game view model, is also refactored as well. I'm actually gonna make it smaller just so you can see like the overall structure of the file. Um, but yeah, this is there's a lot going on here, not gonna lie. There's a lot of uh, code here. What I would probably do, remember I always said I wanted to differentiate between like the human uh, and the computer move? Because admittedly, this is a little confusing, but sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's tough to refactor. So I would just, this is where I would use the comments, uh, human move processing, and then, you know, here is computer move processing, right? That way you can kind of like let them know. I try to be sparing with my comments, but if I think something is, is not readable, I put a comment in there. And again, you get your area conditions and then, you know, what you do when you want to win, what you do in a block. So yeah, that is a uh, tic-tac-toe. I know that was a long marathon video. Hopefully you stuck with it, but these are portfolio projects, right? And the idea here is for this to be your base. Redesign this, uh, maybe add uh, a way for the player to select difficulty, medium, hard, easy, and then you adjust your AI. Uh, maybe you add a two-player mode where instead of playing against computer AI, now you're playing you know, another human and keep, maybe you keep, keep a running score where you save it into user defaults. That's the idea. Take this project, build upon it to make a kick-ass portfolio project that you can show to people and get hired. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you like my teaching style, presentation style, I started creating my own iOS developer courses where we go even deeper than this. Uh, you can check it out at the website on the screen. See you in the next video.